Welcome to Entrepreneurs International Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I'm Roger Killen, the organizer. Today, Bill Stainton is training us on how to monetize our creativity. Bill, I've got a few questions for you that will help us to get to know you at a personal level. Why am I not surprised? Question number one. What's the best piece of advice that you would give to new entrepreneurs? Oh, wow. Get a real job. No, 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 no. That's not, that's not the advice I would give. Uh, entrepreneurship is, is fantastic. Um, Roger, are you taking the helm now with the admittance or? Yeah, I'm taking over the admit. Got it. Okay. So I can, no. um, you know, here's a piece of advice that I, I don't hear too often. And, um, I wish somebody had given it to me. And that is to schedule time each week, each day if you can, but certainly each week, just schedule time to think. Because one of the things you probably understand, it's being an, an entrepreneur, solopreneur, micropreneur, is everything comes onto your plate. And you end up, I don't know if you've read the E-Myth, uh, I think it's at Gerber, the E-Myth, e you end up working you know, in the business rather than on the business. And the whirlwind's never going to stop so you have to schedule time schedule like an hour a week maybe it's on friday afternoon maybe it's monday morning whatever just to just to think you know strategize think about you know what's important as opposed to what's urgent but bill thinking is very hard work think especially for people like me very small brained people <laughs> yes thinking is very hard work but it is important Yes, it is. And if you want to build a business, it's like going to the gym. You know, you've got to exercise that muscle. You've got to, you've got to think. Now, the second question is one I have never asked before. So uh -oh. let's see how it goes. <laughs> what do you secretly wish you could do for a living? Oh, wow. This is when I feel I'm supposed to say something really inspirational and altruistic, like, you know, I'd like to be a teacher or a, you know, a pediatric cardiologist or something like that. Um, uh, the truth is, I'd love to, I, I really would have loved to have been a rock drummer. A rock drummer. Uh, rock and roll drummer. Yeah, yeah. Music is my passion. Uh, so um, drums is my first instrument and, and everything else is my second instrument. But um, yeah, I would have loved to have played Madison Square Garden, you know. Is, is it still true that you are one of the world's recognized Beatles expert? It is. It is. I am a world recognized Beatles expert, which means that they know me in Vancouver. So, that, <laughs> so that's, that's, that's international. That, that, that's internationally recognized. So by the way, so if any of you have any Beatles questions, that's not our topic today, although they were innovative. But if you have any, any pressing Beatles questions, this is the time to ask them. <laughs> I'm going to move on to my next question. <laughs> How what, many of these do you have, Roger? I just have the, this is the last one. All right. What is your favorite, pass, uh, what is your favorite pleasure? I thought we weren't going to discuss that online. Um, We're all adult, adults here. You can yeah. like, lay it on us. My fa All right. My favorite pleasure, I think, has got to be amazing conversation with my sister and brother-in-law over Manhattan's in the President's Bar at the University Club in Chicago. Did you want me to be more specific? Well, I'm curious as to why you would pick that as your favorite pleasure. Because we do it every single year except for last year uh, after Thanksgiving. Uh, we go there and my brother-in-law is one of the world's foremost Beethoven experts. Um, and uh, my sister is an author, and they're both brilliant. And you give me enough Manhattans, and I can fake brilliance. So uh, it works out. Well, Bill, you'll be happy to know that those are three unusual answers. Thank you. You did, you did <laughs> not disappoint. Audience. No, that comes later. Audience, would you type any questions you have into the chat? And during Bill's talk, I will... Uh, batch them and pose them to him so that by the end of his talk all your questions have been answered and can i just have, have a, a quick request for those of you who feel comfortable turning your cameras on please do 
Uh, I understand that for some of you, you may be naked and that might not be something you want to do right now. But uh, if you're able to, uh, and if you feel comfortable with that, and again, we're all friends here, please turn the cameras on because it'll, it'll help. I like, I like to be able to see who I'm talking with if possible. Thank you. Uh, now, audience, you're going to be sent a link to the recording of this talk in a few hours. Uh, but nevertheless, I encourage you to still take notes because the very act of taking notes increases what you abs uh, absorb by anywhere in the order of 30%. Bill, are you ready to wow us with your wisdom? I am, Roger, wow being a relative term. All right, I'm going to spotlight you. You are now spotlighted and the show is now yours. Take it oh away. That is a heavy responsibility and the show is called How to Turn Creativity into Money, which is something that as, as uh, entrepreneurs, we hopefully are all interested in. Uh, hopefully we're all interested in running a profitable business. So now why is that important though? Turning creativity into money, which is my definition of innovation. Why is that important? I'll tell you why. Because do you remember back, do you remember back a long, long, long time ago? I'm talking like, you know, 2019 long ago. Do you remember when the world, when the world looked like that? Everything was right. Everything worked. Everything was exactly where it should be. We knew how things worked and the world was just, it was beautiful like that, right? Remember those days when everything with the world was just right? And then what happened? 2020 hit. And what happened? This happened. The world got turned upside down, right? It, I, I'm sure it happened for your world also. Wave, wave your hand in front of the camera if you can relate to that. If you, there we go. So what happened? What happened? Well, obviously there was a pandemic, but I think it goes deeper than that. I've got a theory. I've got a theory, and my theory is this. My theory is that the entire year 2020 and even into 2021 as we are now, um, the world was secretly, unbeknownst not to us, designed by cats. I think cats engineered this whole thing because only a cat would do that. I, I blame 2020 on cats, so, which also explains you know, the weird toilet paper stuff we were going through there. But here's the thing, um, this is gonna happen. This isn't, just, this isn't just unique to 2020. If you're an entrepreneur or a solopreneur, this kind of thing, this right here, this kind of thing is going to happen to you. You know, things are gonna turn upside down from time to time. That's the nature of the beast. That's the nature of being an entrepreneur. That's, whether you like it or not, that's what you signed up for. So things change, things turn upside down. And sometimes it's a huge thing like a pandemic. Sometimes it's a small thing, you know, some kind of a weird business thing or something like that, but it is gonna happen. If it hasn't happened to you yet, it will happen to you. And here's what happens when, when things like that, when, when, when things are in turmoil or upheaval or big change or something like that, I see organizations ending up in one of four places. And I'm not going to ask you to self, I'm not going to ask you to identify yourself. But as I go through these, I'm just curious if you'll be able to figure out where you are on this. So again, when, when they're, during times of upheaval, during times of rapid change, organizations tend to fall into one of four places. The first one is what I call hibernation. Hibernation. Hibernation is where you just kind of hunker down and hope it's all going to be over soon. You know, you collect your acorns and you hope you have enough acorns to last until this thing's over. And you just kind of, you, you, you just try and wait it out. That's hibernation. The next place I see organizations go is what I call animation. Now, animation is where you're, you're working. I mean, you're, you're not hibernating. You are working. You are working harder than you've ever worked before. The problem is you're doing the same thing you've already, you, you, that you've always done. The world has changed, whether it's the entire world or just your world or the world of your industry or organization. It's changed. You're still doing what you always have been doing, but you're just doing it faster and harder. You figure, okay, that's the same. I just, I just have to work harder and this will work, but you're doing the same thing. Does that make sense? The next place I see people sometimes end up is what I call exploration. Now, exploration is when, okay, you're, you're trying stuff. 
you know, let's a little bit of this. No, that's not working. Let's try a little bit of this. That's not working. And yet you don't really have a game plan, but at least you're trying some new things, right? I mean, you know, you, you don't know where you're going, but at least you're on your way. And then there's the fourth place. And the fourth place is what I call game changer. Game changer is when, is when you're now making the rules. You realize, very good, Roger. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Game changer. Game changer is when you, you are the one calling the shots. When everybody else, from the competition to the consumers, are looking at you going, wow, look at that. You know, Willoughby's got it figured out. Blake has it figured out. You know, Susan has it figured out. Ta Talia has figured this thing out. They're just, you know, they're, they're playing by their rules, and everybody else is playing catch up. You know what I mean? Like, you, you realize that the world has changed. And everybody else is playing catch up. So what is it? What makes the difference? What is it that differentiates the people in hibernation, animation, and exploration from the game changer? Well, it comes down to one thing, and that, that is, that's innovation. Innovation is, is the game changer. Innovation, because innovation means doing things differently. When the world changes, everything is different which means that now you have to do things differently because you can't, because you, we've all experienced this over the past, over the past year and a half, what worked before is just that, what worked before. It's not what's working now. What worked before is not what's working now. And it certainly is not what's going to work, be working tomorrow because the world has changed and your customer's world has changed and we have to be reactive to that. And that means innovation. And what is innovation? Well, people get this mistaken idea of what innovation is. We're going to talk about that more. My definition of innovation is turning creativity into money. See, a lot of people think that innovation and creativity are the same thing. They think that they're, that they're synonymous. Um, and they're not. Creativity is a part of innovation. We'll get into that. But creativity by itself is, is kind of worthless. That's just coming up with the ideas. But once you take those ideas, that creativity, and you turn it into something of value, turn it into money, that's when you're off and running. And there's a technique to do that. There's, a, there's a, a blueprint, basically, for doing that. And that's what we're going to talk about. And it's important that you, non, that you understand this as entrepreneurs, because, again, this is going to happen. You know, this is going to happen. It may not be a global, worldwide pandemic, but it is going to happen. So innovation is really, really important. But here's, here's where it gets a little squirrely. Here's where it gets a little, little weird. Because I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I mean, we all know that we're supposed to be innovative. We hear it all the time. People say, oh, you got to innovate. You got to be creative. You got you to think outside of the box is what you have to do, right? We hear it. You've heard that, right? You need to be innovative. And here's the problem with that. That's, that's not untrue. You do have to be innovative, creative, think outside the box. But the problem is, what if you don't know how? See, everybody's looking at you as, as, as entrepreneurs and solopreneurs and saying, you need to be innovative, but nobody's telling you how to do it. They just assume that, well, you must know how, how to innovate. And what I found in my experience is that people don't know how to, they, they don't know what they're supposed to do. They just think, well, I guess I just have to try and be creative. I'll tell you what it's like. Imagine this scenario. Imagine you're up in an airplane, okay? And all of a sudden the pilot has a heart attack. It just collapses. And for some ridiculous reason, everybody points to you and says, land the plane. Okay. Is that good advice? Well, it may be the right thing to do. You know, if the pilot's had a heart attack and is out of commission, yeah, landing the plane's a good idea. But if you don't know how to land a plane, that advice is pretty useless, right? It's the same thing with innovation. Be innovative. Be innovative. Get more creative. But if you don't know how, it's, it's, you just end up being frustrated. So that's what I want to do during the time we have here. I want to clear that all up so you have an idea of here's how to do it. So you have a game plan for innovation. And I want to try and demystify this whole idea about innovation. Because innovation really is the key to entrepreneurship, but it needs to be demystified. 
That's what I want to do. Is that okay with you? Is that is that all right if we if we do that? All right. So um, I have found that there are loads of people out there, probably not any of you. It's the others who feel who just go through life thinking, "Well, I'm I'm just I'm just not innovative." You know, I'm I'm just not one of the creative people. You know, that's that's some that's not my department. That's that's you know that's up to somebody else. Do you know people like this? Wave your right hand in front of your camera if you know if you know somebody like this, who just well that's you know all that creative stuff is fine for you, but that's I'm not you know I'm an accountant. I'm not you know that's not me or I'm whatever. And that's because people don't understand that there's really not that much of a difference between the innovative people and the non-innovative people. In fact, I'm going to make this real simple. I'm going to make this real, because it is really simple. People overcomplicate things. People overcomplicate a lot of things that don't need to be overcomplicated. So let's make this real simple. Here's how the world works. Here's how life works. We're all walking along, just living our lives, just walking along day, day to day to day, right? We're walking along, and every now and then, every now and then, bam, we hit a brick wall, right? Now, this brick wall, this 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 brick wall can be anything. It can, it can be, you know, you get a flat tire on your way to an important meeting, uh, or it could be anything up to, you know, to a global worldwide pandemic. But, you know, we hit a brick wall, right? So we're walking through life, we hit a brick wall, a major one, a minor one, and we have what I call a Homer Simpson moment. A Homer Simpson moment. You know, we hit that, we hit that brick wall, and we go, go! Oh! And that's where most of us stop. We have the Homer Simpson moment, and we stop. Oh, we may whine about it and complain about it, but basically we hit the brick wall, we have the Homer Simpson moment, and we stop. That's the majority of us. Here's what the innovator does. The innovator does the exact same thing. The innovator, the breakthrough thinker, does the exact same thing. The, the breakthrough thinker and the innovator, they also walk through life, do -de do -de dum 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 and bam, they hit the brick wall of some sort. They have their Homer Simpson moment, but then they do one further thing, just one further thing that the rest of us don't do. They ask a question, and the question is this, how can this be better? That's it. That's the difference between the innovators and the rest of us. We have the Homer Simpson moment, we stop, we complain, and then we move on to the next thing. The innovator, the innovator, the breakthrough thinker, hits that brick wall, and stops and thinks, what we talked about earlier, and thinks, how can this be better? And when you think about it, isn't that really our job as entrepreneurs? To make things better for our customers, for whatever? And see, and, and, and let me clear something else, uh, uh, let me clear up something else also, he said syntactically and grammatically. Um, You'll notice that the Homer Simpson moment, I said it can be a big moment or a little moment, right? Which means that innovations can be little or big. That's another misconception people have. They feel like, well, if, I, if I'm not inventing the iPhone or the internet or the Tesla, I'm not really an innovator. It doesn't count. Have you run into that? Have you ever had that, had that thought or know people who do? That's, look, if, I, if, it's, if, it's not a, if it's not a game changing, world changing innovation, it doesn't count as an innovation. But when you think back, if innovation is only a search for the answer to the question, how can this be better, that means any size innovation counts. You're all innovators. If that's all it is, if it's hitting that Homer Simpson moment and then asking that question, how can it be better, just nod your head for me. Can you do that? Is that something that you can do? I should be seeing a lot more heads nodding. When you run into something, some kind of a brick wall or some sort, whether it's in your personal life or your professional life, you can ask that question, oh, I don't like this, how can I help make it better? And it can be little things as well as big things. Doesn't have to be the Tesla, doesn't have to be the iPhone. I'll give you an example. 
Uh, seeing your faces, you are all too young to remember this, but prior to 2002, none of us, none of us had ever tasted ketchup. It's true. None of us had ever tasted ketchup prior to 2002, and I'll tell you why that is. Because prior to 2002, ketchup grew in bottles like this. This is how you got ketchup. And there was no way on earth to get the ketchup out of the bottle. We tried. We, tr we tried pounding on it. We tried this trick here. We tried shaking it, but it never worked. So none of us had ever tasted ketchup. We all had it, but mostly just as a color accent next to the rice in the, in the pantry. You know, so so we, we had the ketchup. Prior to 2002, for, for 177 years, anytime somebody actually wanted ketchup, they had a Homer Simpson moment. And you've had them too, haven't you? Those of you who remember that. You've had it, it's like this little, oh, dough, right? And for 177 years, people had their Homer Simpson moment every time they tried to pour ketchup. But nobody, now, they didn't call it a Homer Simpson moment all those years because Homer Simpson wasn't even a thing until like 120 years ago. So, but for 177 years, we all had that Homer Simpson moment. And so finally, finally in 2002, some smart person at the Heinz Corporation said, uh, hey, you know them, uh, you know them ketchup bottles we have that everybody hates? What if, stay with me on this, what if we turned them upside down? And now when you go to buy ketchup, this is how you buy ketchup. It's pre-upside downed. They, they solved the problem. You, you can't even... You can't even buy these anymore. I had to buy this on Amazon, and when I did, it said, hurry, only two left. This, seriously, this is an endangered species. This is the white rhino of condiments. I'm never getting rid of this. I'm never getting rid of this. This is, this is, my, this is my retirement fund right here. But look, I mean, how simple is that? You, know, you don't have to invent the test of the eyeball. It's, somebody said, let's turn the bottle upside down. And it was a game changer. Did it change the entire planet? No, but now we all know what ketchup tastes like, right? So that innovation amounted to turning a bottle upside down. Can you do that? Yes, you can do that. Innovation is not that difficult. And innovation basically comes down to three steps. There's actually a fourth one I'll tell you about, but we're not going to go into that here. It basically comes down to three steps. And because my background, uh, just like producer Shana, is in TV, TV and movies, I've called the three steps lights, camera, and action. Lights, camera, action. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, step number one is lights, light bulbs. That's, that's, that's the coming up with ideas. Coming up with, because when you think of ideas, you think of light bulbs, right? So lights, coming up with ideas, that's the ideation stage. That's the creativity part. But there's, there are two more stages. So lights is when you come up with lots of ideas. And by the way, you want to come up with lots of ideas. Too many people, when they're, when they're looking for a solution, when they're looking for some sort of creative idea, Maybe they have a challenge. Maybe they have an opportunity. They're looking for a creative idea, and they think, ooh, I need a creative idea. Ooh, got one. I'm done. Please don't do that. Please promise me you won't do that. Let me give you the key to coming up with a great idea. The key to coming up with a great idea is to come up with lots of ideas. When it comes to ideas, quality is a function of quantity. So... Now you have all these ideas. What do you do with them? Well, you move on to the second stage down there. Camera. What does a camera do? A camera focuses. This is the evaluation stage. Lights is all about ideation. Camera is all about evaluation. That's when you look at all those, all those ideas you've come up with and you figure out which one or ones will we, will we focus on. You know, which are the ones that we're actually going to move forward on? Which are the ones that actually are good? and will move the needle for us. 
That's the evaluation stage. That's camera, because a camera focuses. That's when you focus. And then, of course, action is the implementation stage, because without action, nothing happens. You and I both know this. The universe rewards action. So action is all about implementation. So lights, camera, action. We talk about lights, camera, action. We're talking about ideation, evaluation, and implementation. But I like lights, camera, action better. It's a little easier to remember. Now, I said there was another stage. There's a stage that comes actually before all three of those, which I call finding the script. And we're not going to go into that, but that's basically figuring out what is it that we're going to apply our innovation to in the first place? Are we trying to develop a new product? Are we trying to improve our processes? What's, you know, so what's, what's, what's the script? What's, a, what's the show that we're going to be, that we're going to be um, putting our attention on? You know, and if, you're, if, you're, if, if, you, if you've got the wrong show, then you can do all this innovation, but you're solving the wrong problem. Does that make sense? So the show is kind of like, okay, what's the problem? What's the situation? That we want that we want to work on, um, and then once once we figure that out, and there's there are techniques for that also. Then it's lights, camera, action. So let's go over these one by one, okay? Because I want I want to give you some like some concrete takeaways that you can use that'll help you with each of these three stages. So we'll start with lights because that's that's the first one. Lights is all about again coming up with the ideas. And this, again, we go back to this misconception that people have about what creativity is all about, what ideation is all about, that only certain people are the creative type. See, people have this misconception. They think that creativity is all about the lightning bolt, the lightning bolt that comes down from the sky and it only strikes the gifted few, right? Here's the secret. We are all the gifted few. We are all the gifted few. It's not about a lightning bolt. I'll tell you how I know that. Um, some of you know this. For 15 years, uh, I was the executive producer of the longest running and highest rated locally produced comedy TV show in the United States. It was called Almost Live. There we are. There, there I am in front of Studio B. That was, that was Studio B. That's where we produced Almost Live. Um, for 15 years... My staff and I, our job, our job was to be creative on demand every week for 15 years. And let me tell you something. When your paycheck depends upon you being creative, you can't afford to wait for the lightning bolt. Fortunately, it's not about the lightning bolt. What is creativity really? It's not about a lightning bolt. Creativity is all about connecting dots seeing two or more different things and connecting them in a way that nobody else ever had before. It's all about connecting dots. Now, what are these dots? Well, these dots can be anything. Ideas, experiences, people. Every, every podcast you listen to, every blog you read, every conversation you have with a person, every, every foreign country you visit, every, you know, Anything that comes into your world, every experience you have, that's a dot. That's something that, that you can connect now. And here's what it looks like. Here's what it looks like. Here's a sheet of dots, of Avery dots. There are a lot of dots here, right? There are a lot of dots here, which means, which means a lot of connections. That's good. That's good. This is what it looks like inside the brain of a creative thinker. This is what it looks like inside the brain of a breakthrough thinker. You get a lot of dots, you can make a lot of connections. That's good. Some people's brains, however, look more like this. Very sad, isn't it? Very sad. These are the people who just, they're, they're not like you and me. They're not entrepreneurs. They're not, these are people who just aren't really interested in learning new things, in having new experiences. You know, they're not interested in broadening their horizons increasing their depth of knowledge and their breadth of knowledge i'm and, and it's very sad because there's there's look there's not not a lot of connections going on here right wave your right hand in front of the camera if you know someone like this yeah what wave your left hand in front of the camera if you're related to someone like this 
Yeah. For example, it, it just makes sense, doesn't it? It just stands to reason that the more dots you have, the more connections you could make, which means the odds of any one of those connections being that million dollar idea that's gonna make you famous by Thursday increase dramatically, right? But what, what do you notice? What do you notice about these dots? I'm curious, type, type into the chat. Type into the chat, what do you notice about these dots? Susan's got it, very, very good. Anybody else? You should be able to, because blue, <laughs> blue and round, Roger, that's right, very, um, very specific, yeah. Very close, to uniform, uniform, okay, yeah, uniform. They're all the same, aren't they? They're all alike. They're all three quarter inch navy blue dots. Now, if all of your dots are three quarter inch navy blue, if all of your dots are like, if you only ever, if you only ever, ever listen to the same kinds of podcasts, if you only ever hang out with the same kinds of people, if you only ever watch the same news source, if you only ever read the same kinds of magazines or articles, you know, if all of your dots are three quarter inch navy, navy blue, then most of your ideas are going to be three quarter inch navy blue, right? Not exactly breakthrough. And here's a further problem with that. If all your dots are three quarter inch navy blue, for example, if all of your dots are around your professional arena, like for example, mine's about around innovation. So yes, I do read a lot about innovation. I listen to a lot of things about innovation. But if that's all you listen to, chances are that's what your competition is listening to also. Your competition probably has the same dots that you have, the same three quarter inch navy blue dots. Which means that when you connect those dots, you're gonna have three quarter inch navy blue connections and they're probably not gonna be that different than the same than the connections that your competition is making. Does that make sense? But what if, what if, what if your dots look more like this? Oh, now we're talking. Now you start connecting these dots and there's no telling what color, what color your connections, your creative ideas might be. A, a blue dot and a yellow dot make a green idea. And what if these dots were also different sizes, different shapes? What if your dots, the ideas, the experiences, the people in your life were different colors, different sizes, different shapes, different beliefs? Can you see the difference that would make in both the quantity and the quality of your creative ideas? Can you see that? Nod your head if that makes sense to you. So it just, it, it makes sense as entrepreneurs, it makes sense to try and collect as different, as many different colored dots as you can, right? Not just three quarters navy blue, as many different kind of dots as you can. Because here's the thing, you never know, you never know which dot is the million dollar dot. You never know which seemingly unconnected dot is the missing piece to that puzzle. Does that make sense? But here's the thing. Most of us, most of us are not good at making connections because we're, we're out of practice. We used to be, we used to do it naturally. We used to do it all the time. We're not good at making connections. So I want to try a little activity here just to kind of get your brains into that, into that space of making connections so you know what it feels like. I, I want you to know what, what the creative process actually feels like. I want you to, to get a sense of muscle memory about this. So we're going to do a little activity here. Uh, I got six words here. Okay, seven because litter box is two words, but we're, we'll count as one word, okay? I've got six words here. Um, uh, Blake, Blake McBride, I want you to choose one of these words and just type it into the, uh, type it into the chat, just whichever one you want. We're all waiting on you. Blake, egg. Okay, Blake has picked Ed. Uh, somebody else picked movie, but that's he wasn't following instructions. Okay, Blake. Okay, so Blake has egg. Okay, um, let's go with uh, Tia. Tia Kirk, egg is taken. Pick one of these other words, whichever one you like. By the way, egg was a good choice, Blake. My research shows that people who choose egg are intelligent and unique. 
So that's good. So Tia, it's it's your choice now. Tia has picked Bell. A great choice. My research shows my research shows that people who choose Bell are intelligent and unique. All right. So we have Egg and Bell. Here is what no. Okay, stop. This is those are the two words. Egg and Bell. Everybody clear on this? Here's what I want you to do, and I'm going to give you maybe about a minute for this. And by the way, those of you watching this on the replay or on YouTube, play along. Play along. We have Egg and Bell. Here's the, here's the job. I want you to somehow combine egg and bell in any way you want to. It can be literal. It can be figurative. Combine egg and bell to come up with a product or service that could, that, that, that could be brought to market. Just start typing in. There we go. Blake, right away. Put egg on the bell in order to tune it. In or, oh, an egg on the bell to tune. I'm not quite sure how that would work, but that's good. That's okay. We're off to a good start here. What else? Come on, just start typing ideas. There's no, we don't have time here for evaluation. That's not where we are now. Here, we're just coming up with ideas. Egg and bell to form a product. Or scrambled sound, interesting, don't know what that means. Bell for a two minute egg, there we go, absolutely, yeah. Fresh eggs, now, now they're all fresh eggs and hit the bell when ready. Uh, frying an egg on a hot bell, that's great. When our bell rings, we crack open your egg for you. Create a bell that triggers the chicken to lay an egg. Ooh, that's good. Kind of like a Pavlovian response. Very, very good. Mayonnaise. Well, that's the egg part. Okay. Egg, an egg-shaped bell. A fast food subsidiary of Taco Bell. Great way to, quote, unquote, think outside the box there. A bell that looks like an egg, bell-shaped egg, egg belly. I don't know what half of these things mean, but it doesn't matter because this is not the evaluation part. This is not the camera part. This is the lights part. We're just coming up with ideas. Carry eggs from chicken hutch in a bell. Use bell to carry eggs. Bell rings when you have an excellent idea. Very, very good. Um, so, okay. How long did you all work on that? 40 seconds, maybe? And look at the ideas you came up with. Now, are they all brilliant, fantastic ideas that are going to work? Probably not. We don't know yet because we haven't played with them enough. What? So, and that was like in 40 seconds, and people are still ring bell by throwing eggs at it. Oh, very, very good. Begs bell that can crack open to reveal chocolate chicks. That's good. That's taking the concept of an egg a little further. Because see, sometimes this is just a jumping off point. There's something I, call, I wasn't going to talk about this, but there's something I call the idea that leads to the idea. Do not be quick to discount what you think is a bad idea, because when you play with it a little bit and take it out and you know have fun with it, it can be the idea that leads to the million dollar idea. You know, I think, well, that's not going to work. That's stupid. But wait a minute, wait a minute. What if, what if we turn it upside down and do this with it, and all of a sudden, bam, you have an idea. So any idea, no matter how far-fetched it might seem at this point, could be the idea that leads to the idea. So what you just did, and again, those of you playing at home on YouTube or watching the replay, hopefully you you tried this yourself also. Hopefully you asked your brain these questions, oh, how can I make that connection? Now, is there a real connection between egg and bell? Not really. But when I told you the assignment, your brain started going to work, making those connections, connecting those two dots. That's what it feels like. That's what the creative process feels like. So that's theoretical. How do you take this home to your business? How, how, how can you apply this idea of connecting dots to your business? Well, I'll tell you how. By using what I call treasure map questions. Treasure map questions. These questions are all about connecting dots. And when you do these, when you use these um, in your business, you'll come up with loads of ideas, loads of ideas. Bill, will you, uh, before you uh, get into treasure maps, will you take a question? Uh, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is from Dylan. Uh, I'm quite innovative, but there are many constraints that stifle innovation. For example, financial constraints, higher up decision makers, et cetera, that make a situation stressful and make innovation difficult. His question is, how do you get out of these constraints? First of all, let's clear one thing. I, I certainly understand what you're going through, Dylan. When I was producing my TV show, we had the same thing. I had budgetary concerns. I had staffing, you know, issues. We, you know, first of all, creativity and innovation actually love constraints 
because constraints give you a focus. I always tell people, if you're trying to solve a problem, if, if you're in the corporate world trying to solve a problem, throw at it a little less money and a little less time than is absolutely necessary. Because if there were no constraints, if you had all the budget, if you, had, if, if you could just throw money at it, you would come up with non-innovative ideas. Constraints, first of all, they give you a focus for your creativity. I can prove that to you. Go up to anybody and say, I want you to write a story for me about one of two things. Either option A, anything you want, or option B, a duck that wears a hat. Most people are going to pick option B, a duck that wears a hat, because, ooh, ooh, now I can focus on something, right? So constraints are not necessarily a bad thing. Now, if they're, if they're crippling constraints, then you just have to be more innovative. But innovation thrives on constraints. Look at what, look at what the pandemic did. The pandemic was, is, was and still is one huge constraint, and people are innovating their businesses. They're reinventing their businesses. You know, none of us wanted this constraint. I certainly didn't. Just like Susan, my job was all about getting on airplanes and flying to rooms full of people sitting close together right? This was not a constraint that I welcomed. But, you know, constraints force innovation. So I would say, Dylan, don't think of constraints as the enemy. Think of constraints as the challenge. And anytime there is challenge, anytime there is challenge, there is opportunity. So I think it's, it's a mindset shift, uh, Dylan, more than anything else. So I hope that's helpful. Um, if not, you know, you can You'll, you'll, you'll be able to get a, get a hold of me afterwards if you want to talk about it some more. Okay, I'm going to move on with the treasure map questions because i got a bunch more stuff to cover. Um, treasure map questions. Here's what I want you to do. Whenever you're facing a situation, in your, in, either in your personal life or your professional life, a problem, a challenge, an opportunity, I want you to try these treasure map questions. And, here's what they, and I call them treasure map because they lead to the treasure. They lead to the ideas. There are three of these questions. The first one is this. Ask yourself, who else has solved a similar problem or, you know, solved a similar opportunity? And I don't mean who else in your, in your world, who else in your industry. I mean, look outside your industry. Think about, okay, what, what is the situation I'm facing? What is it at its core? And who else has solved a similar situation? Ideally, outside of your industry, because you want, you want to look at the world differently. That's what innovation is all about. So who else has solved a similar problem? What did they do to solve it, of course? Who and what? And then the real magical one, how can I apply their solution to my situation? Engrave that one someplace. How can I apply their solution to my Notice the question is not, can I apply their solution to my situation? It's how can I? Because your brain will try and answer any question you put to it. So if you just say, can I apply their solution? Your brain will say, nope. Time for lunch. But if you say, how can, my, how can I apply their solution to my situation? It's, me, it's like me telling you, combine egg and bell. Your brain will go to work. And don't stop at just one answer. We've talked about that. Come up with a bunch of them. And these are all basically versions of the, the master question. How is this like that? And that's about connecting dots. How is this like that? In 1440, a guy named Johannes Gutenberg asked that question. He saw a wine processor and movable type, both dots that already existed. Wine processors already existed. Movable type already existed. Gutenberg saw the juice coming out of the wine processor, said, that looks like ink. Hey, I've invented the printing press. Those may not have been his exact words, and besides, he spoke German, but still, that's the point. You understand the point. So that's, that's what that's all about. So now, now you have all these ideas. What do you do with them? Because some are good, some are bad, some are feasible, some aren't feasible. What do you do with them? Now it's time to move into camera mode. And camera is when you focus. You focus in. And this is hard for some people because, like, how, I don't, under, is there a way that I can, is there a tool that I can use to help make these decisions? Because I don't know. Yes, there is. There are a number of them. I'm going to share one of them with you today. I call it the, um, I call it, what, what world do I call it? Ah! I call it the decision maker's friend. The decision maker's friend. Here's how it works. It's basically a, a decision matrix, and some of you may have seen something like this before. Here's how it works. 
everything is done on a scale of one to 10, okay? So the first thing you do is, is you, you decide what the criteria are for your decision. And this is up to you for each individual decision you're gonna make, for each innovation you're working on. You, you, you get to figure out your criteria, you and your team. And then you come up with your, with your options, which are your ideas. Now you'll have more than four. I just made simplify this A, B, C, and D. You'll have many, many more than this. And you, you list the criteria down the left side. Let's take an example. Let's say one of your criteria is that, okay, I want this to be unique, not just an incremental change similar to the company. You know, I, you know, one of my criteria for this one, this is just an example, is that I want it to be unique. And that's actually pretty important to me. I'm going to rate that on a scale of 1 to 10. I'm going to rate uniqueness an 8. Okay, does this make sense so far? So you come up with whatever your criteria are and you, and you assign it a numerical number. How important is that criterion to you? So let's say uniqueness is an eight. Then you look at your, at your ideas, at all the ideas you've come up with during the light stage and you, and you rate them. Like let, let, let's say idea A, your first idea, and you think, okay, is it unique? Well, not really. Let's, on a scale of one to 10, I would give it about a three. Then what you do is you multiply that number that you gave it with the rating for the, for the uh, criteria itself to come up with a, your final number, in this case, 24. Does that make sense? And then you just do that for all the criteria and for all your ideas. Let's say ease of implementation is another one. You know, we, we, this needs to be easy to implement. And you look at your first option and you go, well, it's not very unique, but it's really easy to implement. We're going to give that a four. Ease of, you know, that's important to us, but not that important. But option A, wow, that's really easy to implement. So on a scale of one to 10, we're going to give that a nine. You do the multiplication, that gives you a 36. And then you get to the bottom. Once you've done all that, you just total these up. You, you total the big numbers. And then all you have to do is look at that bottom that, you know, that, that, that bottom row, the total, and the bigger numbers, the bigger the number, the more closely that idea is going to match your criteria for success. So you just, you just break it down and then you, then you just look at the numbers. Does that mean that's necessarily going to be the number you chose to go with? That's up to you. Or the idea you choose to go with, that's up to you. But this is, this is a way to just, again, this is a, this is a tool for evaluation a tool for focus because you've got all these ideas so step one is figure out your you know what are your criteria for this particular thing and it'll your, your criteria will change from situation to situation to situation give each criterion a weight how important is it to you and then go through all your ideas and weigh them against each of the criteriums and come up with your numbers does that make sense you know, it's it's it's, it's, it's a way to kind of um, um, put a metric to creativity, which is something that's kind of been missing. But this, this, will, this will help you. Um, Francisco says the criteria is confusing. It's, the criteria is what is important to you about this decision you're trying to make? What is important to you about this innovation you're trying to come up with? Maybe ROI, maybe profitability is important. We really want this to make a lot of money. Maybe that's not important to you. Um, maybe um, has to be something that we can do with a team of only three people. Okay, you know, wh whatever the criteria are for you, but you have to define those in, in advance so you know what it is what it is that you're that you're weighing all your options against. Because otherwise, there's no way to tell how how can you tell if something's a good option or not if you don't know what good means to you in this situation. Okay. Um, yeah, exactly. This is it's also similar to business idea selection. This this matrix again is the decision maker's friend. It works for any kind of decision, but it also works for innovation and creativity. So that takes us through that, and that takes us to action. Woo! Because without action, nothing happens. Action is the implementation part. This is why I say it's it's about turning creativity into money. Because the creativity alone, that's step one, that's the light. But it's the action when you can actually turn it into money and make things happen. And I want you to think of it this way. Here's how you actually implement. And a lot of, a lot of, a lot of innovation um, plans fall flat.
because nobody knows how to implement. You know, oh, it's a great idea, and then it kind of runs out of steam. Have you ever had that experience? You've got a great idea, you love the idea, and all of a sudden says, well, go do it. You go, um, not so much. Right? You ever had that experience? So how do you implement it? How do you, how do you get the thing done so that it can go out there and make money for you, so it can go out there and create value for the world? Because an innovation that doesn't create value is just, you know, that's just daydreaming. That's, that's nothing. So how do you implement? Well, the first thing you have to do is break it down. Because a big innovation, if it's a big innovation, um, there may be a lot of steps to it, and it may be kind of daunting. That's why a lot of impl a lot of implementation, a lot of the action step never even gets started, because it's just too daunting. You look at it and go like, well, this is, it's, it's, it's too much. So you break it down, just like in my world, in Shana's world, you know, you look at an entire show, a movie or a TV show, and you say, we want to produce this. Well, it's too much. So what do we do? We break it down into a script. And a script is broken down into acts and scenes. Small, bite-sized portions that you can actually shoot and produce. You can't shoot an entire script in a day, in most cases, but you can shoot a scene in a day. Does that make sense? So you break, and again, this is not... This is not mind-bogglingly new, but, but we tend to forget about it. We tend to forget it. So you break down your project, break down your innovation initiative into, okay, what are the steps? What needs to be done first, second, and third? And then what you do is you put them on. Here's, this is the golden tool for an entrepreneur, and none of us use it well. Few of us use it well. A calendar. A calendar. Too many of us live out of our inbox as opposed to our calendar. You know, our email inbox, we wake up, we look at the inbox, and that determines our agenda. Your inbox is nothing more than a convenient storage space for other people's agenda. Your calendar, you control. Your inbox, they control. A calendar, what you need to do is for the things that are important, for the, when, you break your, when you break your initiative down, into steps, into acts and scenes, you put them on a calendar and you make an appointment for the important stuff. Do important stuff. The first question Roger asked me was, what advice would I give entrepreneurs? I said, schedule time to think. Put it on your calendar. Make it an unbreakable appointment with yourself. Every Thursday from 9 until 10. I don't care when it is for you. It could be Saturday, Sunday, whatever. This is this is my this is an appointment. If somebody calls you and says, "Hey, can you?" No, sorry, I'm booked. It's on my calendar. When you when you see it on your calendar, it becomes real. Does that make sense? When you actually see it on the calendar, it's a real thing. Well, I can't, I can't, because I've got some, I've got something on the calendar, right? And it turns out these calendar things, um, they also are available online. It turns out. So you know your computer has one of these. You know Google has one of these. So. You do this stuff on your calendar. I'm going to give you a little gift here. Here's the magic sentence for getting stuff done. If you're one of those who just can't seem to get stuff done in your world, you know, you've got a to-do list that's too long and you never get stuff done. I'm going to give you the, here's, here's the magic sentence for getting stuff done. This is courtesy of a, of a book called Atomic Habits by James Clear. The magic sentence for getting stuff done is this. I will behavior at time in location. The research shows if you, if you can attach a time and a location to what you want to get done, you are um, a big percentage that I forget right now, um, but you're much more likely to accomplish it. I so an example, I will meditate for 10 minutes. That's the behavior. At 6.30, in my bedroom. Again, when you assign a place, and the place might be at Starbucks, it could be, you know, whatever it is, but you're much more likely to get it done. I will study leadership for an hour. Okay, that's the behavior at 3 p.m. in the library. Does that make sense? Just take a screenshot of this if you need to. Just, I will, if, if, when, when there's something you want to get done, you put it in this format, write it down someplace, and then put it on the calendar. 
and you, your, your chances improve dramatically uh, about getting it done. Um, one of the last things I want to leave you, there's, there's a wonderful book called The One Thing, written by, who's it written by? Gary Keller. The One Thing, and in the book, Gary talks about breaking down, like, what is it that's going to move your needle forward in your business, in your life, in your business, and break it down to what's the one thing that you can do consistently that will make a difference, that will move the needle in your world. Is an, is an entrepreneur, is it reaching out on LinkedIn? Is, I mean, what, what's the one thing for you? Um, uh, in my case, as a speaker, it's reaching, is, is I, I make five sales calls a day. Every day, Monday through Friday, five sales calls a day. I don't always get through to somebody, but you know, it, I, I know that if I do that, then the results will follow. So what's the one thing you can do on a consistent basis? Maybe it's daily, maybe it's weekly, that'll move the needle. When I was working in television, I had the real good fortune to work with this guy several times. His name is Jerry Seinfeld. He's a comedian. He's pretty good. Well, back when Jerry, Jerry told me this once, and you know, he's said it in several interviews, but, you know, but, but he told me also, he said back when he was starting off as a comedian, you know, the book, The One Thing, was not, was not written yet, but he figured out what his one thing was. And for him, his one thing was writing jokes. Now, it could have been going to open mic nights, it could have been calling comedy clubs, but for him, he decided it's writing jokes. And he got a wall calendar. And he still does this, and he, he checks off every day. And his key rule is don't break the chain. Every day he writes jokes. Now, he has a much nicer calendar and a much nicer wall now than he did back then, but the principle is the same. Every day he writes jokes, and every day he puts an X over that. Yes, I did the thing. And again, the key thing is don't break the chain. Figure out for yourself as an entrepreneur, as a solopreneur, what's the one thing that will lead to results, the one thing that you can do, and don't break the chain. So last thing I want to talk about real quickly, because it doesn't necessarily apply to, to um, many of you, but it will in the future perhaps, and that's how do you lead an innovative team? What do you do? Like if you've got a team that needs to be innovative, like I did when I was working in television, I'm going to give you just one tip. One tip on how to lead an innovative team, and it's this. Give them the what. Let them surprise you with the how. Don't tell them how to solve the problem. Creative people love solving problems. If you solve it for them, that takes all the juice out of it for them. Your job as the leader is to give them the what. Here's what we want to accomplish. Now, you tell me how we should get there. Creative people love that. And they will surprise you with the how. They will come up with ideas that you never would have come up with. And a lot of those ideas will be better than anything that you could have possibly come up with. Look, this is going to happen in your world. If it hasn't happened yet as an entrepreneur, it will happen. Your world will turn upside down. Maybe it's a little thing. Maybe it's a big thing. So what's the master key? What's, what's the one thing, what's the one tool you can bring, on, bring when this happens, when your world goes into upheaval? It's innovation. Hopefully now you have a little clearer idea of what innovation is and how to do it. We've given you some exercises, some activities, and some tools to innovate. When you learn how to innovate, well, that's how you turn creativity into money. Thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you so much for your attention. I really, really appreciate it. It was a blast seeing all of you. Thanks so much. Bill, I, you were so good that very few people needed to ask a question because you clearly preempted them with the information <laughs> that you shared. So on behalf of the 77,000 members of EIN, I'd like to thank you very, very much for taking us into a strange place. Uh, we don't often sit and think about dots and where does innovation, where do ideas come from? And everything you have said and asked us was quite provocative and I really benefited uh, from your completely 
novel approach to a novel topic. So okay. thank you uh, very, very much. I've got, a, I've got a free resource for everybody if they're, if they're interested. Um, Why don't you lay it on us? I will lay it on you now. It's a, it's a cheat sheet. If you need ideas quickly for something, um, it's my little cheat sheet called Turning Creativity into Money, Five Quick Ways to Generate Ideas that Keep the Competition Up at Night. If anybody wants this cheat sheet, you can just go to my website, BillStainton.com backslash Roger in honor, in honor of our fearless leader, Roger Killen. BillStainton.com backslash Roger. You just enter your name and email and you will have immediate access to Turning Creativity and Money, my cheat sheet, five quick ways to generate ideas that keep the competition up at night. Now, how, how do you spell Roger again? Only I spell it R-O-G-E-R. <laughs> Bill, thank you for that uh, resource, that cheat sheet. I'm quite sure a lot of people will take advantage of your kind offer. Thanks, Roger. I hope so.